So now we're going to introduce Dr. Olabi Akala. Dr. Akala is board certified in emergency medicine, and he's a member of the Trauma Level 1 team at DHR Health. He obtained his medical degree from Albert Einstein Medical School in New York and completed his residency in emergency medicine from New York School of Medicine. Let's welcome Dr. Akala. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Akala, and I work in the emergency department here at DHR Health. So we'll talk a little bit about the role of a level one trauma center, uh, especially for the community and in terms of taking care of patients. Um, and then we'll go through a few cases that we've seen in the emergency department just to just to illustrate the importance of, of, uh, of a trauma center. So we'll start with uh, a little bit about trauma epidemiology. Uh, we'll talk about the golden hour concept in trauma. And then we'll go through a few cases and then we'll kind of round up with the role of the level one trauma center uh, in the community. So in terms of epidemiology, trauma is the number one cause of death in childhood and up to the age of 45 in the United States. It's the number three cause of death in all ages uh, uh, behind cancer and heart disease. Um, and in 2018, which is the most recent data we have, it was 37 million patients presented to uh, emergency departments due to trauma. Um, <clears throat> the very important thing to think about with trauma patients is the, the concept of the golden hour. So in, with patients who have trauma, few patients die in the first after the first 24 hours from traumatic injuries. The majority of patients die either immediately or within about four hours of arrival to a hospital. So that golden hour is the first hour after the injury where you really have to focus on a rapid and systematic evaluation of the patient, resuscitation, and then definitive management depending on what injuries you find. Uh, and again, important concepts you always think about, rapid, accurate, and systematic assessment. So you want to make sure you don't miss anything, but you need to move quickly to make sure you don't, uh, that you address any uh, life-threatening issues within a reasonable period of time. Resuscitate and stabilize. And then you need to determine what resources are required for the management of a patient. So in a level one trauma center, which is the highest level, you should have all the resources that you need to take care of the trauma patient. Um, in lower level trauma centers, so level two, level three, or level four, you, need to, you should have some resources, but if you, need, if you have a complex trauma patient that needs to be transferred, you should have efficient and expedient processes to get those patients to a level one trauma center where they can get the care that they need. Um, and again, part of the job of the trauma center is of a level one trauma center is to kind of lead that network of hospitals that take care of trauma patients within a uh, specific region. With that said, we'll kind of transition into a few cases that we've seen in the ER recently, um, and it'll kind of illustrate some of the care of the trauma patients. So first case, we have a 28-year-old man, uh, motorcycle accident. The report we get from the pre-hospital providers from EMS is he T-boned the car about 30 miles an hour, his blood pressure is about normal, 120 over 70. Heart rate is 120, uh, uh, which is a little bit fast. He's a little tachycardic. Um, the oxygen saturation is normal at 100%, and the Glasgow Coma Scale is 15. Basically, it's a measure of how awake and alert the patient is, and that's normal. So basically, he's awake, he's talking, he's complaining of pain in the, in the, in the abdomen, as well in the left lower extremity. Uh, the report we get also is that he's pale, sweaty, and anxious. So and it will be in the emergency room in about five minutes. So what do we do? We, we get our team mobilized to take, care of the, to take care of the patient. So the trauma team includes physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, operating room staff, uh, and uh, surgeons to help take care of the patient. So when a patient gets to us, we do what's called a primary trauma survey. Basically, it's a systematic approach to look at, to assess the patient for any potential life-threatening injuries in that golden hour, in the first, when they first arrive. So the first thing you focus on is anything that affects breathing, uh, airway and breathing. Basically, is are they able to get oxygen into their lungs? Because um, if they can't, they really have five minutes before they start having brain death. Anything that has, that's causing any problems there needs to be assessed immediately. The next thing is circulation. So that has to do with bleeding and how well they're perfusing their different organs. Uh, a lot of that is why you look at the blood pressure, the heart rate, any signs of external bleeding or any clues that they may have internal bleeding. 
And then the next part is disability. So any signs of neurologic injury or how, what's their mental status? How awake and alert are they? That's where you, that GCS scale comes in. And the last part is exposure. You gotta check head to toe um, to see if there's any signs of traumatic injury anywhere. Because again, you wanna move quickly, but you need to be systematic and comprehensively assess the patient. The idea is you get through your primary survey within five minutes uh, after the patient gets to the uh, emergency room. And if you find a problem at each point, you have to address it before you move to the next thing. So in our patient, he came in, remember I told you he was having some abdominal pain, his heart rate was a little bit fast, it looked pale and sweaty. So the initial thought on his primary survey is he's probably has uh, bleeding somewhere. We didn't see any bleeding externally, so the idea is it's probably has internal bleeding. Uh, one of the studies we do immediately is an ultrasound uh, in trauma patients it's called a focus assessment with sonography for trauma. And if you take a look, this is his liver and this is his kidney. You shouldn't have any space between the kidney and the liver. But if you see there's this sliver of dark material in the abdomen. What that tells you is you have fluid in the belly. The patient just, came, uh, just had a motorcycle accident and has fluid in his abdomen. More than likely, it's blood. So he's got internal bleeding. Now, his blood pressure is stable. If his blood pressure is unstable, he needs to go to an operating room to try to figure out where the source of bleeding is. Since he's stable in terms of his blood pressure, we had time to get a CAT scan. A CAT scan is, just think about it like a bunch of x-rays, uh, but with a lot more detail. And what you are looking at is a cross section of the abdomen, all right? Um, so this is a normal CAT scan here. Is the liver, stomach, is your spleen. This is the, patient, uh, the patient's CAT scan. His liver is normal. This is his, uh, that's his uh, stomach. But if you look at the spleen here, there's some areas that are a little bit lighter. If you look at a normal spleen, it's just kind of a homogeneous shade of gray. But if you look, there's some areas that are gray, there's some areas that are a little bit bright, and some areas that are dark. So the bright areas are the areas where he's actively bleeding. The dark areas are clots that are formed around the spleen. Um, and basically, we already have an idea that he's got bleeding internally. As soon as we see this, and actually, as soon as we saw the, the ultrasound showing there's fluid in the abdomen, we've already started the resuscitation process, which is we know he's bleeding, so we have to start a, a transfusing blood products. And what we do is what's called a massive transfusion protocol. Um, which the details may be a little bit beyond the scope of uh, this, this talk, but you start with the appropriate transfusion protocol so you can resuscitate and avoid the patient getting, uh, his blood pressure getting worse or getting, going into shock. Um, this is a little bit of a bigger picture of the CAT scan. Again, you see a little bit closer that there's clearly an injury to the spleen. Again, like I said, we have to move quickly, but you have to be comprehensive. This is the patient's femur. So the femur is the bone, bet is the bone between the hip and the knee. And if you can see, he's got multiple fractures here in the, in the femur. It's a little bit of it's a, a separate view here. Here he's got a, a multiple fractures here. The other injuries he had is, uh, this is the, t the tibia and fibula bone between the ankle and the knee. And you can see he's got a bunch of fractures in the fibula, which is the smaller bone. And he had a little piece from the motorcycle that was embedded in his, uh, in his right leg. So the idea, again, is within an hour of arriving to the emergency department, we've identified he's got a laceration of the spleen, he's got active bleeding in the abdomen, he's got a femur fracture and a fibula fracture. So again, you've got multiple injuries. You have to triage or you have to prioritize what needs to be intervened on first. So what's likely going to kill him if it's, not, um, if it's not treated or if it's not addressed is the intra-abdominal bleeding and the laceration of the spleen. So, like I said, the interventions we did, we started with the blood transfusion, a medication called tranexamic acid, which helps decrease bleeding in patients who have uh, trauma. Uh, he went to the operating room for a splenectomy, which is basically removing the spleen. It's not, in, it's not an entirely, uh, it's not a vital organ for life. So the treatment generally when you have a bad fracture like that is to remove the spleen. And then he subsequently, a few days later, had the repair of the femur, and the fibular fractures as well as the removing of the object that was in his leg. But again, you have to kind of think of what are the injuries, what needs to be addressed immediately, and what can wait uh, once the patient is more stable for uh, further evaluation. Uh, case number two, uh, we have a 51-year-old guy. 
Uh, he fell from approximately 15 feet at work. Uh, and he fell uh, straight down and landed on his, on his butt. His main concern was that he was complaining of pain to his pelvis. So uh, again, in his primary survey, yeah, normal blood pressure, uh, his uh, airway breathing circulation seemed okay initially. Um, he was, his Glasgow coma scale was 15. He had normal mental status, he was awake, he was talking. Um, and after we fully exposed him, basically the main concern was pain in the left side of his pelvis as well as a little bit of the abdomen. So the next study we got was a x-ray, all right? Um, again, because of the pelvis, the pelvic uh, pain, we wanted to take a quick look at the pelvis. Um, this is a normal pelvic x-ray here. So you just take a look. These are what called, what's called the iliac wings. These are the femur where they attach to the pelvis. And I want you to focus on this. This is the pubic symphysis, is where kind of both sides of the pelvis come together. This is the patient's x-ray. So the key thing to notice in a normal x-ray is the pelvis kind of forms a ring, all right? Um, and that shows you that's a pretty stable pelvis. If you take a look on this side, the pubic symphysis is off each other. And what he had was like a vertical shear injury. That, that's what they call it. Basically, on the left side, his pelvis is pushed up. And the ring in the pelvis, which you have pretty nicely here, is broken. When you see that pattern of injury, you need to think that this patient has internal bleeding. That when you have a force enough to break up the pelvis like this, that means you have shearing of the blood vessels in the pelvis at least. Maybe more, but at least. So you already start thinking, I need to resuscitate this patient. So we started, uh, when this patient first came in, his blood pressure was normal. The subsequent EK blood pressure went from like 120 over 70 to like, 100 over 60. So blood pressure was slightly going down. His heart rate was going fast. So that clued us in that, you know what? He's, he's bleeding internally. The initial intervention here is you put on what's called a pelvic binder. What that does is it, it decreases the volume in the pelvis to tamponade the bleeding, to put pressure on the bleeding. And since he stabilized after that uh, intervention, we sent him for a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Again, on the left is a normal, just for reference. What you should notice here, again, this is liver, this is spleen, this is stomach, but you see this gray stuff just outside the liver, just outside the spleen. All that is massive amounts of blood in the abdomen. So like we said, like we suspected after seeing this, what's called an open book pelvic fracture, uh, we had suspected it was bleeding. Well, once we got the CT, it's actually a lot worse than what we, had, uh, than what we initially suspected. So again, He's got the summary of his injuries was the intra-abdominal bleeding. What ended up called being the source of the bleeding was that sheer injury, but it wasn't just in the, in the pelvis. It went into the stomach, the blood vessels that uh, feed the small intestine. So that's the reason why it was bleeding so quickly in the abdomen. And then he also had some pelvic bone fractures. Um, and again, the interventions, you also have to think, massive transfusion. You got to make sure you don't get behind in your resuscitation. And then... Uh, initial surgery to control the source of bleeding. There is a concept which, again, probably a little beyond the scope of this, of call, that's called damage control resuscitation. You go in with the initial surgery to basically temporize and deal with the source of bleeding. And then a day or two later, you go back to do the final repair and closing the abdomen. The idea is you don't want to have a lot of swell. You don't want to close the abdomen when there's a lot of swelling after a big traumatic injury. And then subsequently, a few days later, the pelvic fractures were fixed. Again, you always have to think about what do I need to deal with initially and what can, be, what can wait for a little bit more time to get definitive repair. Case number three is a 19-year-old woman. Um, she had a reportedly accidental self-inflicted gunshot wound to her head. So she was with a couple of her friends, apparently, had a gun pointed to her head and uh, accidentally fired. Uh, when she got to us, she was lethargic. Her Glasgow coma scale was nine. Remember I told you 15 is normal. Nine, just think of someone who's sleepy and, and you can kind of arouse them with painful stimuli, but they're not fully, they're not fully awake at all. Um, the, what we do initially in those cases, because those patients are not maintaining their airway, during the primary survey, we intubate them, we put them on the breathing machine. Again, you want to take away any issues related to the airway or oxygenation immediately. After we went through the primary survey, there were no other injuries. All we saw was just the, the gunshot wound to the head. 
Um, so I just want to show you a normal CAT scan of the head just to have a sense of what it looks like before looking at hers. So this bright white stuff is the skull. The dark stuff here is the ventricle within the brain. And then this gray stuff is mostly the brain matter. Um, and in her, this was her CT. She had, again, this was a bullet fragment that was stuck in the left side of her parietal lobe. And this track right here, where you can see a little bit of this bright stuff, is basically the track that the bullet fragment took in her brain and a little bit of bleeding in there. Um, again, like I said, there were no other injuries. So the main concern was getting her to the operating room immediately. Um, she went to the operating rooms. The fragments of the bullet that they could get out was removed. Uh, and also, she was treated with a few drains to decrease the swelling in the brain. She was admitted to the intensive care unit and actually was discharged to our inpatient rehab unit about 17 days after the injury. She went to rehab 26 days uh, total after the initial presentation. She went home. And actually, she's independent in all her activities. The only uh, deficit is she's a little bit slow in answering questions. But considering the severity of her initial injuries, she's actually done remarkably well. And then uh, the last case uh, is a 55-year-old guy we found unresponsive after an ATV accident. So the, the presumption, because he wasn't witness, was it he was thrown off an ATV. Um, he had no helmet on. Somebody found him and an and a ATV not too far from him uh, and him just laying down unresponsive. Like I said, his Glasgow coma scale was eight. Um, on his primary survey, uh, because of the decreased mental status, we intubated him again, take, taking care of his airway. And the significant injuries that we noticed with him was he had a skull fracture with a traumatic, with intracranial bleeding, so bleeding in and around the brain um, due to the trauma, as well as a fracture of the right tibia, which is the, the bone between the knee and the ankle, and the patella, which is the kneecap. Um, so this is the CAT scan of the patient's head. Again, this bright white stuff here is the skull. There's swelling on both sides of his head, uh, but that's in the scalp. This bright white stuff here is blood in the brain. Now, it doesn't look like a lot of blood, but again, if you have uh, injuries in the brain, the issue is never how much bleeding occurs. The issue is that the skull is very rigid, the brain is semi-solid, and when you have bleeding, that bleeding takes up volume within the brain and basically pushes and squishes the brain. So if you look here, the ventricle on this side, which you can see, you can't see on this side. It's a lot smaller here. And if you look at the midline of the brain, the brain is basically uh, completely shifted to the left side. That is a major emergency because, again, the more the brain is compressed, that's what leads to brain death. That's what leads to uh, morbidity or mortality. Uh, this was the, uh, the rest of his injuries. Again, uh, this is a fracture through the patella going into the knee joint. And the kneecap, you can't really see very well, but it was also broken. So, again, you have to think in patients who have multi-system injuries, what, it, what system do I need to take care of first? And clearly, in his case, he needs decompression of the brain initially. So in terms of his hospital course, patient was intubated. We started on medication called hypertonic saline, which helps with decreasing the pressure in the brain. Um, and then he was taken to the operating room by a neurosurgeon emergently. And then his right knee uh, fracture was fixed a few days later. Again, you always have to think priority in terms of what's the most life threat, what needs to be addressed immediately, and what can be taken care of later. Um, so all those cases kind of help us illustrate what's the role of a level one trauma center within a region or for the community. And the first thing is improve clinical outcomes. In a level one trauma center, you have all the, all the specialists, all the resources to take care of patients with complex injuries. Um, and again, it takes a, a huge team of, uh, of medical staff, a huge amount of resources, a lot of equipment to be able to take care of these patients. And there are a lot of literature in, the, in, re, in research that shows patients with complex trauma injuries, they have decreased mortality, meaning decreased risk of dying, and also uh, decreased morbidity, long-term uh, uh, injuries or long-term uh, disability if they get treated in a specialized trauma center. In addition, the, the level one trauma center uh, is a leader in the region in terms of trauma education, research and also planning of the system. And this is essentially the, the, the 
concept is the trauma level one is the leader within an integrated trauma system. As we mentioned in the epidemiology, trauma is common. You're going to have traumatic injuries um, regardless. It's, it's, you had, what, 37 million visits in 2018 to ERs. But the idea is there are different levels of severity. The most severe cases should be at a level one trauma center where you have the resources uh, to take care of those kind of patients. But the more minor injuries are okay to go to a level two, a level three, or level four trauma center that, again, may be able to take care of some issues but can't take care of the most complex patients. And then finally, if you have a patient who's complex that presents to a lower level trauma center, you need the system in place to be able to efficiently and expediently get them to a level one trauma center. Like we said, that golden hour of trauma is very important to intervene to prevent people from dying or from having long-lasting injuries. So um, in general, uh, the level one trauma center, you clearly you think of the acute hospital care and you have all the resources, but there's also a lot more to the role of the level one trauma center within a region. First things first, you think of prevention. So for a couple of our patients, you can think about it like educating the community about wearing helmets if you're on an ATV or a bicycle or a motorcycle, uh, gun safety, uh, using seat belts if you're driving, using car seats for kids, uh, not driving while impaired. All of those uh, preventative efforts are led by, a, by the trauma, one, uh, trauma level one within their region. Also, access and pre-hospital care. Again, you have a lot of trauma patients within a region you want to make sure they have adequate access and quick access to a complex to, to a level one trauma center if they have complex injuries. But you also want to make sure that your network of hospitals that are level twos, threes, or fours are able to efficiently take care of patients with minor injuries. And if they have patients with complex injuries, they can come to the, to the level one trauma center uh, uh, for whatever issues they have. The next part, and like we already said, was the acute hospital care. Patients do better if, with complex injury if they go to a level one trauma center that has the resources. And then uh, rehabilitation, as you can see with our patient with the gunshot wound, after the initial trauma, what helps getting the optimal outcomes in terms of uh, functional status and being able to get back to your normal life is working uh, uh, on rehab over time and, and, and working to get back to their uh, previous uh, capacity. And then another huge component of the level one trauma center is research. So if you think about, again, the, in, in, for trauma patients, the, the importance of research is not just being able to um, understand what's their quality care right now, but it's building the, the standard of care going forward and making sure patients in your community are part of that process. Because if they're not included in some of these studies that are involved in the research, you won't get results that may positively affect your, your specific patient population. So for example, I included a, a few studies that guided the management of the patients that, we, that, that I discussed. So for example, this CRASH-2 trial, really that's the study, all of these are within the last five years, by the way. That's a study that basically showed us that tranexamic acid in patients who are bleeding decreases mortality. And again, five years ago, we were not routinely using this. It's our standard of care right now. The idea of having a research uh, institute here um, as part of DHR's uh, level one trauma center is, again, we wanna make sure that moving forward, the standard of care is defined by the work that we're doing here in our facility and for our patients in our region. Another example is um, the, the way we transfuse patient, patients. 10 years ago, if a patient came in bleeding, they primarily got red blood cells. But what's understood now is it's not just the uh, red blood cells that are important for improving outcomes. It's transfusing platelets, uh, the red blood cells, and plasma. And also in the ratio, you want to do them in a balanced ratio. Again, this is a little bit clinical, maybe a little bit beyond the scope, but the idea is the, the knowledge that was not present five, less than five years ago 
guides the standard of care right now. And we want our community to be part of uh, the studies that will set the standard going forward. Here's another example for the patients with the uh, intracranial injuries. Hypertonic saline was not always the standard of care. Manitol for a long time was kind of thought to be the best agent. In the last few years, it's clear that my hypertonic saline is more su is superior to mannitol for decreasing intracranial pressure and decreasing mortality and morbidity. The idea, again, is we want to be at the forefront of the research to help create new knowledge and set the standard of care for trauma patients. Um, again, same idea with damage control resuscitation, which is the idea that you go, it, well, it's an entire concept, but the idea that, you, again, the initial surgery is to temporize the bleeding and to, to take care of the acute injury, but you go back in a day or two to try to, to finish the definitive surgery. So again, all these concepts come out of research and having a trauma level one with a strong research infrastructure helps improve the, the, the quality of care within the region as well as the, the care we provide to our community. And on that note, um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, thank you very much. Yeah. It depends on the injury. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is, if you are requiring a massive transfusion, about how many units of blood products are we given? It depends. Um, generally, when we activate our massive transfusion protocol, our blood bank knows to get at least six units of blood, plasma, and platelets. So you start with at least 18 units. Depending on how bad the bleeding is, we continue until we tell them to stop. But initially, we have, we have at least 18 units allocated to that patient. Uh, once, yeah, but with a neurosurgeon. <laughs> oh, sorry, have I ever done a burr hole, uh, which is to decrease the intracranial pressure? Yes. How long brain surgery lasts? I will defer to a neurosurgeon because um, uh, generally the neurosurgeons take them to the OR. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to make up a number. I will defer to a neurosurgeon on that. Oh, uh, four years of college, four years of medical school, um, and then for emergency medicine, it's four years of residency. Thank you all.